السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرة ما ما بعد. We welcome you back to those beautiful late night khatiras and heart softeners from Valley Ranch Islamic Center on this very blessed, hopefully, inshallah, tabarakah, whatever by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, the 28th night of the month of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who will witness Laylatul Qadr, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And get the full reward for Laylatul Qadr and the last 10 nights of Ramadan and the entire month of Ramadan, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Uh, brothers and sisters, last, uh, uh, last night we discussed together with Shaykh Omar Sulaiman um, the subject of um, how since they remove the sense of uh, protectiveness, the sense of haya. We said that when it comes to protectiveness, this is basically is the, the barrier, these are the shields. These are the fences by which you, uh, um, uh, you protect your heart from falling into the traps of the sins and so forth. When you have that sense of jealousy for the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal, sense of protectiveness for that which is right and wrong based on what Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like having a disciplined life as a Muslim, that is very powerful. That will help you stay away from that which is wrong because now you have a high standard of character because of that. Now, in order for you to fuel that, you need that sense of haya. You need the sense of modesty. We said that haya is, a, is an inner thing that translates into an act of modesty, how you act with people, how you act with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the opposite gender, and so on. And obviously, we differentiate between haya, which is a positive energy to make you do that which is right and stay from that which is wrong, uh, versus khajal, which is a, a misunderstanding of haya. Many people, they think, you know, khajal is, is okay, meaning, you know, uh, no, don't pray in front of everybody because, you know, I, I feel shy from uh, uh, doing my religious duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, you shouldn't. That is considered khajal and it's not acceptable. al haya is a different story. Shaykh, now we talked about this so very important topic and I want to hear, inshallah, from you and your, your point on that. Allah yabarak fiqh, Shaykh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi man wa la. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on the author, Imam al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, and accept mm -hmm. from him. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us all in Firdaus al-A'la with our Imam Muhammad, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on the highest level, Allahumma ameen. SubhanAllah, this is really a, um, it's an interesting idea here because it ties a different consequence, a major consequence that has probably the least immediate material effect in your life to this concept of sinning. And that is the greatest thing that you can gain in trial is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The worst thing you can lose in sin is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking about losing out an, on a ni'am, on blessings, on wealth, on you know, prosperity, on authority, when you're talking about the way that sin can corrupt your family life, it can corrupt your home. The worst thing, as Imam al-Qayyim rahimahullah mentions here, is that it would cause you to lose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here's the thing, if you lose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not something that will be as immediately apparent as some of those other consequences, but it is going to be the worst effect of that sin. And so it's kind of like haya is your, your protection, right? Between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this concept of being in awe of the sight of Allah. And a person who has gone from shame to shamelessness has deliberately calculated in a way that does not include the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their daily equation. And so as a result of that, there is not just the loss of barakah, there's this concept now of abandonment. And I, I'm going to say from the outset, because we are trying to balance out, obviously, hope and fear, hope and fear. So if you've noticed over the last few nights, we always kind of start with the consequence, then how do we kind of deal with that consequence? Abandonment is not the same thing as being banned. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so long as you are alive, he has not shut the door on you even if you left the house, mm -hmm. right? So even if you've been kicked out of the house, you still have a phone and you still have a way back. Whereas Iblis is the only one who is banned, kicked out, rajim, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas the rest of us have a way back to the house. But this is where the chapter now ties into that, uh, this, this notion of abandonment. SubhanAllah, that reminds me what he also said, what he said last time, um, in regards to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all these boundaries, with all these rules that he sets for you, he says, Rahimahullah ibn Qayyim, he says, قال, لَيْسَ أَحَدٌ أَحَبُّ لَهُ الْعُذْرُ مِنَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَ In hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No one loves to give excuses. No one loves to give grace and grace period more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even though the boundaries are still there, 
And Allah is saying, this is for your own good. But if you violate these, these rules, and if you, if you break some of these rules, and you fall short from holding to these principles, Allah still opens the door of grace and tawbah and repentance for you to come back to Him. So being righteous, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're flawless, you have no sins, no mistakes. Being righteous is that you take about accountability of what you do, and whenever you do something wrong, you find your way back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even if the door was closed, you keep knocking, because Allah promised. He will eventually open the door. And that's one of the beautiful things of Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah. He says, قَالْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَىٰ إِذَا أَغْلَقَ بَابًا بِحِكْمَتِهِ فَتَحَ بَابًا بِرَحْمَتِهِ That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closes a door out of wisdom, He will open another out of mercy. Like you will never find all the doors to be closed in front of you. As a matter of fact, one of our mistakes is when people keep knocking on the same door over and over again forever, because they want to go through this door particularly. But Allah has opened for them tons of doors behind them. He's only focusing on this. So this is what brings us here to the very important notion of the next chapter, inshallah ta'ala. Would you, would you mind actually if I kind of elaborate on this Please. analogy for a bit? Because it's Please. one that actually resonates in a very profound way for anyone who had a deep fear of disappointing their parents. No. Uh, if, if anyone hates to disappoint their parents. And so Allah belongs the greatest example. The house is not all the same. You've got the bedroom, you've got the living room, you've got the courtyard. I want you to actually kind of, you know, not embellish the analogy, but take it a step further, okay? There is an owner of the house clearly, and that owner is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets boundaries and gives you rules. And you hate to disappoint Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is Maliki Yawmuddin, the master of all things. You hate to disappoint him. And if you think about a parent who calls you back, uh, Probably one of the worst things that could happen to you is when your parent gives up on you. When the person that has constantly been trying to set boundaries and restrictions for all of these years or trying to call you back just says, you know what, just go. It's not out of a lack of love for you, but that can be one of the worst feelings. Like, man, I disappointed to that level, right? There are different ways that the ulama conceived of this idea of coming near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at-tariqu ilallah. And so I want to give you an analogy of, in, in this regard. I want you to think about those that are outside the house and those that are inside the house but that want to be in close proximity to the Lord of the worlds. Think of the outside as sinning and the inside as ihsan, pursuing ihsan. I don't want to just be in the living room. I want to enjoy closeness, qurb, closeness to my Lord. And this is when you start to see that one sentence, and Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah actually mentions this of the genius of the way that this religion is given to us is that the same sentence can appeal to you based upon your circumstances. So for example, وَبِلْ أَسْحَارِهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ They're seeking forgiveness in the last part of the night. And he says, rahimahullah ta'ala, that some people are seeking forgiveness in the last part of the night because they feel like their qiyam wasn't sufficient. <laughs> so you got people that have been praying all night and they're like, وَبِلْ أَسْحَارِهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ And you're experiencing that now. You're experiencing that. In these last 10 nights, you prayed, but you feel like you didn't pray enough. Maybe you feel like some moment slipped you. So you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness at the end of the night because you feel deficient. Whereas he says, for some people, it's waking up to say istighfar, to seek forgiveness because they have sinned and they're trying to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَجَعْلَ اللَّهُ وَقْتَ السَّحَرُ Allah made that time of the night the best time for both the sinner to come back and the worshiper to draw nearer. So here's the example I want you to think about. One of the salaf, and it was one of the most powerful things I ever read. Uh, he said that he had a dream and in that he perceived that he was in conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, Ya Rabb, kayfa tariqu ilayk? Like, oh my Lord, how do I get to you? I imagine if you just like have Allah in front of you and now you know you're in dialogue with the Lord. Ya Rabb, kayfa tariqu ilayk? How do I get to you? How do I come to you? And Allah Azza wa responded and said, Utruk nafsak wa ta'al. <laughs> Leave yourself and come. Leave yourself and come. Put yourself at the door, your nafs, the lowly self, at the door and approach me. I don't shut the door on anybody. And so if you're outside the house trying to get in, utruk shaytanak wa ta'al, put the devil out and at least get inside the house so that you're safe. And then if you are looking to be in a state of ihsan, in a state of true closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, utruk nafsak wa ta'al, put your lowly self aside and approach the Lord of the worlds with these beloved deeds that we have. 
And the same sentences, the same ayat, the same notions apply to us no matter where we are on that journey back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah give us not just the place in the house, but a place in close proximity to him in these last 10 nights and beyond. Allahumma ameen. Ameen, Abul Ameen. Ameen. And that brings us to the chapter that we're having today, subhanAllah. Al-Ma'asi sababu nisyani Allah, nisyani Allah li abdih. Sins can cause that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to abandon a person and forsake them completely to leave them for themselves and for the shaitan. Here we're talking about you desiring to be uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want to have that proximity to Allah azza wa jal. But then eventually because you're not going into the direction of those doors, you're going somewhere else. Obviously, if you turn your back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're not going to find your way. Right. You're going to find somewhere, but not the way that we're supposed to be. And that's what he says, rahimahullah, qal, some of these punishments that people, uh, people receive because of their sinful life, that it is really, it, it causes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to abandon this person and forsake them completely. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forsaken you and leave you to yourself and to shaitan. So shaitan starts devising all these plans for you and you just follow the shaitan. Your nafs obviously feels uh, uh, attracted to the shaitan's whispers and suggestions because it's the lowly nafs that you talked about. And eventually it becomes easy for them to follow that path. He says, قَالْ وَهَذَا أَهْلَكُ الْهَلَاكِ الَّذِي لَا يُرْجَ مِنْهُ نَجَعَ He goes, this is the worst form of destruction. That is, you can't find, you can't find salvation for, from this. Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has abandoned an individual and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you forgot about Allah azza wa jal, Allah will make you forget about yourself. So what does that exactly mean? He said, that means basically is when Allah causes you to forget about yourself, then you start forgetting about achieving, because of these sins, what is good for you. What is for your own welfare, your own protection, your own growth, your own... You know, when someone is obsessed with a particular sin, you guys tell me, how many, how many opportunities a person will, will, uh, uh, will abandon, will skip, would uh, uh, turn down because their obsession with fulfilling that desire, that particular sin, is taking over their mind, their heart, their way of thinking at all. Can you imagine that? So you're supposed to be, let's say, the smartest person on the planet. You're supposed to be the greatest engineer or master, the most successful business person. We talk about dunya goals, right? You're supposed to be the one in Firdaus al-A'la, the, the, the most devoted worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lofty goals for the Akhirah. But uh, eventually, if you start committing these sins, the desire to fulfill uh, the, the pleasure, the temporary pleasure that comes with that sin, is going to take you far away from uh, uh, fulfilling all the obligation to get you there. Even in matters of dunya, how are you going to advance if you're always busy just uh, satisfying your, uh, yourself, your ego, your desire? I mean, you're not going to find yourself... Uh, you're going to find the way that takes you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to success. But if a, someone has the fear of Allah in their heart, and Allah subhanahu and they know Allah azza wa jal, and they walk on their way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will find it easy, easy for them, inshallah azza wa jal, to, uh, um, uh, to turn away from all these temptations, because I'm focused, I'm disciplined. Uh, how is that going to happen? With a sense of protectiveness. I have haya. I have the glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in my heart. I have honor that I need to protect. All these things coming from that, and that's right. how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped them reach their, that good uh, point in life. But if they decide, if they decide to turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sins, Allah will cause them to forget about the path, the journey that they're on, and they get lost. And Shaykh, these, this in particular, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, um, refers to al-mubiqat, right? The destructive mm. sins, the major sins. And this is where that distinction becomes super important. There's a difference between someone who's trying and slipping and someone who's sinning and trying to sin. And when the Prophet ﷺ says, inna li kulli shay'in shirra wa li kulli shirratin fatra, that everything has an upper limit and a lower limit, right? You got your peak and you got your low course. The ulama mentioned, the scholars mentioned that the shirra, which is what you're in right now, this is your peak, your peak performance, is when you're doing the obligations and more. You're doing the obligations and more. Your fatra is when you're low faith, when you're, when you're really not feeling like it, right? You hit a low point and you're not feeling like worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at that point, you don't do al-kaba'ir, you don't do the major sins, and you don't leave off your obligations. So I want you to understand this concept again. The Prophet is saying, here's the spectrum of the believer. Shirra, your peak, which is when you're 
everything is firing on all cylinders. You got your salah, your qiyam, your Quran, your siyam, all of it going all together, fasting, charity, everything. Your low point, all of us have a low point. The Prophet says everyone has a low point. Your low point, even then, you don't give off your obligations and you don't commit the major sins. And the Prophet said, لا يزني الزاني حين يزني وهو مؤمن ولا يسرق حين يسرق وهو مؤمن A believer does not commit adultery while he is committing adultery or a person, I'm sorry, an adulterer does not commit adultery while he's committing adultery and he's a believer ولا يسرق حين يسرق and he doesn't steal while he is stealing and he is a believer and in one narration ولا يقتل حين يقتل وهو مؤمن and he doesn't kill while he's killing and he's a believer What does that mean? You know, the Prophet ﷺ, in one narration, it's like Allah removes the roof of iman, the roof of faith from you while you're committing those major sins. Uh, Ibn Abbas describes it as, he says, this is your faith in the believer. So belief in the believer. When you're committing those major sins, it's like this. And then once you finish committing those major sins, it comes back. Whatever's left of it. Whatever's left of it. And it's not going to be the same. Because you, you unhook, hook, unhook, hook. It's going to be a looser hold every time, right? So the Prophet or so Ibn Abbas عنهما, is saying, like, look, it's like this. When you're committing those major sins, you and belief go like this. Then when you finish, you go like this. Are you sure you're not going to die when you're here? And even if it comes back, is it going to be a steady and firm? So the believer does not go into the major sins because once you go into that territory, you are a person who intentionally forgets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You tried. You can't do those things unless you try to forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while you're doing them. And that's when Allah says, fine, you've forgotten Allah, I've forgotten you. Not that Allah does not know you or that Allah doesn't know who you are, but Allah cuts you off until you're done. No. Go pursue what you're going to pursue. Mm. Once you realize that it's not what it's been made out to be and you want to come back, you know how to get back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But don't be so sure that you won't die while you're in that state of pursuing that particular path. Which leads to the next paragraph that he talked about, uh, alluding to the hadith that you mentioned. Uh, that so Allah, I the jumped the gun with the hadith. No, the Prophet ﷺ actually talks about that, the subject of iman here. But before this, he says, وَمَنْ عُقُوبَاتِهَا As a result of that, what happens when someone turns away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and start living that uh, sinful lifestyle and so forth, قَالْ فَإِنَّهَا تُخْرِجُ الْعَبْدَ مِنْ دَائِرَةِ الْإِحْسَانِ it removes you out from the circle of Ihsan or from the realm of Ihsan. Like imagine um, the whole creation, uh, the whole creation was made for, with Ihsan and for Ihsan. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Tabarak, الذي بيده الملقى الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا. He created life and death in order to try you. Who amongst you will be أحسن عملا? Which means what? They do everything with ihsan. And ihsan here means excellence in the most perfect way, which is the, what we consider it to be the human perfection, the relative human perfection. Not the angelic perfection, but the human perfection. Now, even when you make mistakes, you fix it. But the point is, he says, when someone keeps going on that path, it takes him out of that, out of that realm of ihsan, trying to do everything you know, perfectly with excellence and goodness and so on. And he mentions it, قَالَ فَإِنَّ الْإِحْسَانَ قَالَ وَتَمْنَعْهُ ثَوَابَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And you will lose the reward that Allah has, has put for those who do things with ihsan. فَإِنَّ الْإِحْسَانَ إِذَا بَاشَرَ الْقَلْبَ مَنَعْهُ مِنَ الْمَعَاصِي He goes, ihsan, if it, if, it reaches the, if it strikes the heart and if it exists in the heart, it will prevent the heart from pursuing the path of sins. Why? Because ihsan is there. And doing sin is considered what? Deficiency. It, it, it's considered the failure. And uh, uh, your heart is looking for what? For perfection, mm. for ihsan. So, but sins, it's failure. So as a result, if you don't, if you keep going after ma'asa and after sins, you are losing. You are losing your, your moments of ihsan and, and, and leaving the realm of ihsan to the next one. Qal, he said after that, it's not just a matter of uh, um, you know, leaving the, the realm of ihsan. He goes, if the person continues to do that, what happens? You guys, you remember Islam as the Prophet ﷺ described in the Hadith Jibreel and Umar Khattab radiallahu anhu warda. Qal Islam three categories, right? Or three would say degrees. The base degree is called what? Islam, which means submission to the rule of Allah subhanahu wa taala. That's basically what you need to practice: the salah, the siyam, the dua, the dhikr, and so on. 
Many, many people do that. But how many people do this with conviction in the heart? Or at least with conscience in the heart? Those who do so go to the next level, al-Iman. So now you have it in your heart. You're spiritual right now. And the more you do of this, the more you practice with your heart, not just with your body and with your limbs, that leads us to the highest level of Islam called what? Ihsan. In which the Prophet described by saying, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاهُ That you worship Allah Azza wa You worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see Him. That's the certainty of sight. He's talking about the sight of the heart, not the sight of the mind, not the sight of the eyes, obviously. قَالْ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاهُ If you could not get that level of certainty, that you see Him, then at least you're absolutely certain that He sees you. Sheikh, I have to throw something in here Please. that just dawned upon me as you're saying that. No. If the true sweetness of worship is found in knowing that Allah is watching you, what possible sweetness would you have in sin if you know that Allah is watching you while com you're committing that sin? Like how bitter and like unbecoming is a sin at that point when you're thinking and to and ta'budullah ka'anaka tara, the sweetest worship is when you're worship and you're not even thinking about, I mean, look, it's good to think about the rewards in Jannah, but the sweetest point of worship is when you hit that moment and you know that you're talking to him, you feel him watching you, and your heart is observing him, and that's the best form of worship. Can I, can I add so, a little bit yeah. one more to it? No. You know that he's watching you while he's pleased with you. Like imagine, for example, if you're, you have a child, right? The child uh, comes to you with something, with a work that they've done, and you praise them for it. Then they go to continue, and they see that you're looking at them. And while you're looking at them, they know that you're happy with them, you're pleased with them, and you do that thing right now. How, how excited they are to do more of this. How excited, how, how happy they feel that that mom, dad, you know, they're looking at me, and they're excited to do more of this because that brings the pleasure of my parents and brings their attention to me. And that's what kids usually, they, 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 they fight for in their life. The, the, the parents' attention, subhanAllah. Walillahi al-mathal ala, Allah has the best example. So you become like a show-off with your parents, right? Pretty much. And that's what Ibn al-Qayyim said. You know, it's interesting. Like, <laughs> Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, says, like, every human being loves to be seen. Of course. Everyone, so riya is a natural, look, look, there are sins that prey upon natural inclinations, but you're fulfilling them in a way that's displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there are sins that are unnatural, and you have to almost cultivate something that's unnatural and perverted, and then act upon it, and those are even worse than the ones that are based on something natural. So obviously, why do people drink? They enjoy escape from their problems. Why do people commit zina? I mean, it's pretty obvious why someone would commit adultery or would, would fornicate because they enjoy that type of you know, interaction, they enjoy that type of intimacy. When it comes to when it comes to wanting to be seen, everyone wants to be seen. But Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is saying the believer does two things. Number one, you want to be seen by Allah. Like, you know, you talk about that kid that like is, is like looking to their parent, like to see if their parent is looking and always seeking that, that, that approval. You want so bad to be seen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point that Fulay rahimahullah said, you start getting protective over your good deeds to where you start hiding your good deeds the way that you'd hide your sins. Because like, man, like I only want Allah to see this because I only want to, I want this to be between baini wa baynahu. I want it to be between me and him. The second thing is, you delay that craving to be seen to the day of judgment. <laughs> Everyone wants to show off. But you know what you do? You're waiting for the moment that you get that book in the right hands. You're going to be such a show off. If you get your book in your right hand, may Allah make us from the Ahl al yameen from the people on the right hand. Amen. If we're, if, may Allah make us from the people that receive our books in our right hand. I'm going to run to you and say, Sheikh Yasir, there it is. Here's that good deed that you did not know about. Like leaving the spark of spot. Like you. leaving a, that, that night that I came. <laughs> I left it for the sake of Allah, you know. Actually, you know, but, but subhanAllah, like we're going to be running to people in the majlis. Like, hey, remember me? I prayed at night, you didn't know about it. Hey, mm. I gave some charity, you were not aware of it. Check it out. Ha We read it tonight in Surah Al-Haqqa very beautifully, by the way. Here it is, here it is, here it is. So you're delaying it because at that point, Allah is the one who handed you the book and said, I'm proud of you. No. Now go on. Because you, so, you've secured that, that pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that point. That's interesting because I want to elaborate on the child's actually example, subhanAllah. What's an interesting thing. I mean, you've seen these uh, videos that go viral. 
how kids will be on the stage to perform in a, in a school, uh, uh, let's say, play or something. Kindergarten kids, right? They're standing all there, and they have maybe 200, 300 parents sitting in front of them. And there's this young child that is looking through the, all, all the crowd. Look, everybody's happy, except for this child that's going to keep like worrying and anxious, still looking around until they spot their parents. SubhanAllah, when they spot their parents and their parents wave at them, it, it means the whole world for them. Their smile becomes, mashallah, they're shining. This is the exact same thing when you deal with Allah subhanahu I don't care about people looking at me. I'm looking for the one and only in this whole crowd that I want to please them. I want, their, I want to have their pleasure because those are the, he is the one who, it, it means to me the whole thing, obviously. So imagine this, that all this crowd and my performance and my ibadah is not for these people. I'm doing it only for the, for the one and only because I want him to look at me. I want his attention. I want his pleasure, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why he says that al-ma'asi would deprive you from that feeling. You would stop desiring this. You would stop looking for that moment of uh, validation and attention and recognition. Why would you want, want that anyway? You feel ashamed to begin with because I know I'm not, more worthy, I'm not worthy of it anymore. Just like we said, that path takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and goes unfortunately to destruction. And as a result, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you forget about me, I'm well, fine. I'll let you go. He will forget about you as well too. And here's the thing. Imam Ibn Qayyim Rahim Allah says, look, that's not just, there's more even danger. More than this. Like what? He goes, look, this is taking you out of the circle and the realm of Ihsan. But then when you go out of the realm of Ihsan, where would you, where would you go? Hopefully, the realm of Iman is still a higher degree than Islam. But then that's when he brings hadith in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, قال صلى الله عليه وسلم, he says, قَالْ فَإِنْ أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا If Allah still wills good for this person, أَقَرَّهُ فِي دَائِرَةِ عُمُومِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Still he will keep you within the realm of the believers. Still, overall. Not the muhsinin anymore, but the believers. قَالْ فَإِنْ عَصَاهُ بِالْمَعَاصِ But if this person continues, continues to commit sins, even though you're still in the realm of the believers, but if you continue to commit these sins, قَالْ أَلَّتِي تُخْرِجُهُ مِنْ دَائِرَةِ الْإِيمَانِ Then this person will continue until they leave the realm of Iman. So now, they only do salah, siyam, and it has absolutely no flavor, no taste, no... You don't savor the sweetness of Iman anymore. You're only doing it out of duty, out of obligation, and it becomes hard to do. Abstinence from the, har from the muharramat, staying away from alcohol, staying away from zina, staying away from watching something haram online and so on, it's painful. Why is it painful? Because you're, you, you're reminding yourself like, why can't I do this? Why is this haram for me, for example? You're not seeking the pleasure of Allah anymore anymore because you're out of the circle of Iman right now. You're barely on the boundaries of Islam. And that's what he called the hadith, La yazni zani hain yazni wa hu mu'min. A believer, a believer, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, God, you, this person is not a true believer at the moment when they commit fornication. Until they're done from it, then whatever is left of their Iman comes back to them. So he says, here, look, look, it's dangerous. If you continue this path, you're going to leave the, the, the realm of Ihsan to the realm of Iman. Continue on the same path, you're going to get out of the realm of Iman to the realm of Islam. Like you're barely holding you know, to, the, to the narrow uh, uh, string to the deen. Anything can shake you. Because right now it's all about satisfying your lowly nafs and satisfying your pleasure and your desire. So, Sheikh, can I um, just comment here? So, just no. to re emphasize really powerfully, and you can give some practical examples. Look, Wherever you're aiming, you should anticipate that there's a possibility you're going to fall short. Mm. So if you're aiming for 100%, there's a likelihood that you're going to fall short of 100%. If you're aiming for 50%, you know, you're know you going to fall short. Aiming for ihsan, aiming for excellence, would make it so that missing out on a voluntary deed would make you more upset than a person who aims low when they miss an obligatory deed. Right? That person, for example, that comes to Fajr every day, May Allah make us people of Fajr. Allahumma ameen. ameen. The best ameen. thing, let's, let's all kind of make this intention together, inshallah, that we're going to try to be people of Fajr after Ramadan. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. make the, if you can make this your intention for Ramadan, it's a beautiful intention that we're going to be people of Fajr. A person of Fajr, if they're aiming to pray Fajr in the masjid every single day, they miss Fajr once in the masjid, it's the most miserable thing in the world for them. It's not fard for them to pray every single Fajr in the masjid. Right, according to the majority of the scholars. But, yeah, I mean, meaning Fajr, of course, is fadl. That person that says, you know what, yeah, I, I, I aim to pray the five prayers. I'm a Jum'ah guy. Show up at Jum'ah. You know, 
they miss Fajr itself two, three times a week. That two, three times slowly becomes four times, becomes five times. Then it, it bleeds in, right? So you want to consider these layers, like those three circles that you're talking about, so profound. If you aim for Ihsan and you fall to Iman, Alhamdulillah. If you aim for Iman and sometimes fall to Islam, Alhamdulillah, you're still safe. But if you're merely aiming for Islam, then when you fall, where are you going to fall? Sheikh, that's what the Prophet the says in the hadith. If you're going to be asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, then ask him for what? For the highest place in Jannah. Don't say, well, I'm not deserving of it. I don't want to feel sh even so shy and ashamed of even asking for it to begin with, right? So therefore, you would say, Ya Allah, just allow me to be in Jannah. If, you, this, is, if this is your highest aspiration, you're not going to do anything much, really. Because for you, just like, oh, I want to just something that will qualify me just to cross over the bridge from Jahannam. That's it. And if that's your biggest goal, then there's a big chance this person is going to fall short. And if they fall short from crossing the bridge, where are they going to end up, Ya Jama'ah? They're going to end up in Jahannam, Allah Musta'an. Like, I, 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 I honestly, honestly, I met somebody. We were talking, I don't know, I hope he was joking about it. But when we were talking about this issue, he says, Sheikh, he goes, look, Sheikh, I don't care. As long as I get out of Jahannam eventually, I'm good. وَقَالُوا لَن تَمَسَّنَا نَارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودَاتَ That's what Allah said, Bani Yisrael did. Like, Multiple people exactly. say stuff Exactly, can like you that. imagine how low our way of thinking has become, unfortunately? Like, people know that some believers, yeah, because the Prophet mentioned the hadith, when the believers cross over the bridge, or the bridge over Jahannam, and they meet on the other side, they start looking at each other, just say, hey, we're missing this person and that person. And they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah will allow them by the shafa'ah, by the intercession, to go and collect them from out of Jahannam. One after the other one. Until no one else is left in Jahannam except for those who are lost, had detained by the shirk. That's it. So there comes this guy and he says, well, as long as I can actually get out of Jahannam, I'm okay. Like, subhanAllah, if this is his, this person's aim, then what is left for him if he's going to do something haram? It's going to be probably maybe kufr or shirk. Here's another analogy, Shaykh. The Prophet is described as what? The moon. Naam. The Sahaba are the stars. No, no. Aim for the moon, you'll fall amongst the stars, inshallah. <laughs> so just try, try to set that as your standard. Don't set these low. Bani Israel's behavior, literally, and you might hear and you're like, that's audacious. They said, listen, we go to hell, it'll just be a few days. Mm. We go to hell, it'll just be a few days. Very few people would say it that way. But here's something that you'll say that means practically, functionally the same thing. Yeah, I'm a Muslim, but you know, I'm, I'm not all that Muslim right now. I'm, not, I'm a non-practicing Muslim. That's the, most, like, that's the most contradictory statement. I'm a non-practicing Muslim. Muslim means submitting yourself. <laughs> I'm a non-practicing submitter. So it's the same thing that's being implied. Functionally, practically, you're saying the exact same thing as the guy who says, We only go to hell for a few days. Because you're saying, you know, yeah, I don't, you know, I'm not the best Muslim. I'll, you know, just like we said, embrace the identity of a repenter, not a sinner. Mm -hmm. Stop this whole nonsense like, you know, I'm a flawed Muslim. I'm a, no, no, you're a Muslim. Allah says, call yourself a Muslim. Ya ayyuhaladina aminu, aminu. Oh, you who believe, believe. You aspire to be a believer. You aspire to be a muhsin, to be a person of ihsan. And call yourself by that in the aspirational sense, not in the arrival sense. And yeah, you're not the amanu udkhulu fi silmi kafa, which you in Islam wholeheartedly. Yeah. And as, as Allah described Bani Israel, qal atu'minu ba'd al kitab wa takfuruna bi ba'd. Are you going to believe in some and leave some? And that's unfortunately what's happening in our time these days. People are becoming selective Muslims, really. You go to, to the menu of Islam and you become selective. Like, you know what, I'm. Like you said, I'm a Jum'ah guy. Alhamdulillah. Someone else comes and says, look, I'm a, I'm a, Eid, I'm a Eid guy. Right? And that's why they park in our parking spots on Eid. Right? Because they because don't come they don't here know, throughout the entire <laughs> Take our parking spots, man. On Wallah, Sheikh, worse than this when someone says, look, I'm over the bridge guy. Like just as long as I can cross over the bridge in any way, in any capacity, I'm, I'm happy with that. This I've is never how met a person like that. Well, Allah, Allah must die. I mean, I hope they're joking when they mention these things. And it's just like their, their perception of themselves, how much they're willing to offer of their time, their energy, themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is as this law. This, this is their threshold. It's just like, like I heard that point because we were, dis we were discussing hadith, um, the last person who will, who will exit Jahannam. It's a very long hadith. 
in which the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the ta- that person who will be the last to leave Jahannam. And the condition of this person was just horrible. The way it was described in the hadith. Eventually he enters Jannah. And then someone comes and says, if I can be this person, I'm happy. Like Allah Akbar, they're willing to go through Jahannam, a'udhu billah, and suffer the punishment that God knows what type of punishment it is going to be. Because Jahannam, astaghfirullah, you can't, you can't just يعني, mess with it. You can't really just uh, joke about it. It's, it's, it's serious matter, jama'ah. وَمَا قَدْرُ اللَّهُ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ They haven't gonna, given, given Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the right estimate of His greatness subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَرْجُ اللَّهُ وَأَخَافُ ذَنْبِي شَيْخِ That's the thing, Allah will spare you from what you fear, but do you even fear it? Allah will spare yeah, you from what yeah. you fear if you have hope in Allah and you fear your sin, but do you even fear it? So you just have to, you have to say, look, your Lord is so beautiful, subhanAllah. Subhan. You're saying, اللَّهُمْ إِنَّكَ عَفُوٌ تُحِبُّ الْعَفْوَ فَعْفُ عَنِّي I can tell you, by the way, you know, like, one of the most beautiful du'as, I, one, of, one of my teachers, he used to say, it, what, what, he basically combined uh, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu's du'a, mm. and he used to say, Allahumma adkhidni jannah to bi ghayri adawi bi ghayri hisab, oh Allah, enter me into paradise without any form of questioning and without any form of punishment. Wa amitni wa ana shahidan fi baradi nabiyyika sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and grant me shahada in the city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like he just put it in one sentence. And I'm like, that's such an audacious ask. Let me die and not be asked or go to, or be punished for a moment. Let me not be asked about a single sin or punished for a single sin. And let me die not just as a believer, but as a martyr in the city of the Prophet ﷺ. You're calling upon a Lord who's generous. And you got it. So you got to have that hope and you got to have that fear. But if you're not even meeting Allah with the hope and the fear, what, I mean, what are you, what are you meeting Allah with at the end of the day? So there's got to be something to that content. And, and I do have a question for you, Chef. Maybe we leave a question and answer I can ask you now. No, it's up to you. Ta'ala. I just want to mention something here important before we go to the question, inshallah ta'ala. He says, as a result of that, when the person is out of the realm of ihsan, out of the realm of iman, then they will be um, basically the, the biggest losers. And he mentions what opportunity they're losing when they're out of these, uh, these circles. He says, قَالَ وَمَنْ فَاتَهُ رُفْقَةُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ if you are out of the companionship or the company of the believers, because now you're out of the circle, out of the realm of belief and, and, and iman, and you're out of the, uh, uh, the circle of the people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala vowed to defend and care for and protect. Because Allah says Allah defends those who believe subhanahu wa ta'ala. قال فاته كل خير رتبه الله في كتابه على الإيمان. You will lose every single opportunity of goodness that Allah has subhanahu wa taala has qualified for the people of iman. And he mentioned a list of them. I mentioned a few things quickly, inshallah ta'ala for you here. قال فمنها الأجر العظيم. One of them is the greatest reward. And if you talk about the most generous, you can imagine the reward you get from the most generous subhanahu wa taala. قال الله تعالى وسوف يؤتي الله المؤمنين أجر عظيم. Allah shall give the believers a great reward. قال ومنها الدفع عنهم شرور الدنيا. One of the things that you miss is losing the defense that comes from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for you against the evils and atrocities and the adversities of this life. قال إن الله يدافع عن الذين آمنوا. Allah defends those who believe. قال ومنها you lose also the استغفار of the angels, الملائكة وحملة العرش and the carriage of the throne because Allah mentioned in the ayah الذين يحملون العرش ومن حوله those who carry the throne. Uh, of the angels of, of the thrones, they, they praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they say Alhamdulillah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they glorify Allah, who believe in Allah azza wa jal, seeking forgiveness for the believers. And he mentioned a long list, but 15 different items that Allah in the Quran, he said, he will do this for those who believed, do this for those who believed. Because if you're out of that realm of belief, out of the circle of mu'mineen, you're only in the circle of Islam, Barely a Muslim, يعني. if you're out of the circle of Iman, you're losing all these privileges. Yeah, and, and here's the privilege. thing, Shaykh, all of those privileges, you can't see. Yep. So it goes yep. back to the vision of the heart. So you oh. are relegated to the immediate material pleasure. It's right in front of me. Mm. Like the wine bottle, the drug, that, that adultery, the temptation, it's all so physical, material, immediate, right in front of me. It's instantaneous. I know it's real, but like, to the believer, those angels that are carrying the throne that could be seeking forgiveness for me, 
are just as real as the people that I can see right in front of me. And I don't want them to be like not seeking forgiveness for me or, or cursing me instead of seeking forgiveness for me. So it, it once again is the ability to transcend the immediate, the physical, the material, and to connect yourself to the unseen to the point that it is what drives you. The unseen becomes the driver over the scene. And the greatest part of the ghaib is the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The greatest of the unseen is Allah Himself. Greater than the angels, greater than Jannah, greater than all of that is Allah Himself. So the pleasure of His sight, the unseen Lord driving you, overwhelms everything of the scene and just makes all of that not just consequential to man, like if I commit the sin, I'm going to lose barakah in my car, I'm going to lose no. barakah in my family, I'm going to lose out on this job, bad things are going to start happening to me, my du'as are not going to be answered. I don't want to lose Allah. I don't want to lose Allah. Like that's the biggest thing at stake here is the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while he's pleased with me. I want to meet Allah on the day of judgment and have that reunion, that celebration. You know, I, I told you all this last year and I don't, I don't I, you know, I, it's something subhanAllah that I know we all forget a year after year, but I remember this, uh, the, this, just saying this and some of the brothers saying, you know, I kept that with me for the year. Look, have a secret between you and Allah that is so private that when you think of your meeting with Allah on the day of judgment, it's like, let's talk about that secret, Ya Allah. Have this good deed between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that no one else knows about. It's like a good secret. Not a, you know, let's, let's forget about just exhuming, you know, getting the skeletons out of the closet. You know? Just think about like the secret. So when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's like you, if, you, if you've got a secret with someone else and you and that person are in the room and both of you know about it and no one else knows about it, right? Meeting Allah on the Day of Judgment, and I'm looking forward to this part coming out. Wow, the reunion, so. the reunion. Go back to your Lord as a Rabb that you can't wait to be reunited with, not as a master who brings back his rebellious slave on the Day of Judgment, his prisoner, and says, stand in front of me now. You have nowhere to run this day on the Day of Judgment when you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah azza wa uh, protect us from being Ameen, in that state. Ameen. And may Allah make Ameen. us Ameen. of Ameen. those that are reunited with him on the Day of Judgment. Shaykh Imam ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala comes to this now final paragraph we're going to talk about inshallah ta'ala. He goes, as a natural consequence of that obviously, when you are out of the realm of ihsan, you become out of the realm of iman right now. What happens to this heart? Qal, these sins, what they do, what they do to you, فَإِنَّهَا تُضْعِفُ سَيْرَ الْقَلْبِ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالدَّارِ الْآخِرَةِ It will weaken the heart awaken the heart's journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the hereafter. Like that journey right now becomes, um, you know, uh, uh, troublesome, heavy. Uh, I, I don't want to go there anymore. You know, I'm not so excited as I was before to be on that, on that, on that uh, path. It's not the same anymore. قال, it might hinder the journey or the path. And so it's basically kind of like slowing it down eventually. Or it might actually cause this person to cease being on that journey altogether. And we have seen people do that. What we call them, we call them drop out, really. Yani. And I remember growing up in a, in a, in a time, subhanAllah, in the 1980s, uh, when we see, mashallah, there was a revival of Islamic spirit, really. Yani. And the people come into the masajid and, mashallah, find this a new way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But obviously, a lot of people, they come excited about the path, but then when they start walking through that path, it's very actually difficult and hard, a lot of requirements, a lot of, you know, discipline, all that kind of stuff. So what happens? They leave it. Because people. Yeah, that's it's true. Because, like, other people Probably are so yes. annoying, right? It's like, you know, and that's actually the point. The one who mixes with the people and tolerates the hardship of that is better than the one who doesn't mix with the people and tolerate the harm. You know, subhanAllah, nothing's going to make you put up with people for the sake of Allah except that your love of Allah and wanting His pleasure is far more than the annoyances of the people because people can't stop me from pursuing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So when you say, I give up, I'm not doing this masjid stuff anymore, or how many of the MSA burnout folks do we have, right? Like, man, this MSA stuff is terrible. How many people get involved with the Muslim community or get involved with an organization? Like, you know what? That was a terrible experience and then they just kind of disappear. Show up at Taraweeh every once in a while. Show up at Eid and take our parking spots, right? Yeah. The burnout <laughs> hits you and then it's like, all right, now you're trying. But look, when you're saying, what, what you're saying is, I didn't get the appreciation and validation from people. 
and therefore the struggle is no longer worth it. Again, mm. in effect, that's what you're really saying. If you gave it up for the people, then were you ever really doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That doesn't mean don't find another masjid or find another effort because indeed some organizations, some places do become too toxic for you to operate in. That's understandable. But when you just give it all up because of the people, then were you really ever doing it fi sabirillah? So if it was for the sweetness of that reward you anticipate from Allah, working with Muslims is painful. It's so hard. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Yeah, well, like, you know, and then, and then you add social media to this as well. Like, what a headache, right? Like, Muslims can be such a headache. We can hurt each other so much. Like, we take, we rob the sweetness. We take the spirit out of the room. We take it out. Like, we're, it's, it's all self-inflicted wounds. It's like, Islam would be so beautiful. Our institutions would be so beautiful. We'd work so beautifully together if we didn't let our egos get in and start, like, trashing each other and, and you know, undermining one another and beating up on each other and making it so rough for each other. What if we were all tawasu bil haqi wa tawasu bil sabr, right? Pursuing Allah together. So it's self-inflicted wounds. But you know what? That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, turns out the real ones. Those that are going to stay the course. Yeah. Like that one, I put that person through a lot. We talked about Uthman radiallahu anhu yesterday. Radiallahu anhu Uthman. You know an interesting fact about him, Shaykh? He's the only one of Khulafa al Rashidin that didn't die at the age of what? 63. 63? No. The Prophet, Abu Bakr, Umar, and Ali, may Allah be pleased with them all, they all died at 63. Uthman is the exception, lived into his 80s, right? Late 80s. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And subhanAllah, the, the, the sadaqa, the risk. Like, the older you get... So can I share something about yeah. Uthman radiallahu anhu? Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... That's a personal interpretation, really. Why would Allah azza wa jal uh, allow Uthman to be the third khalifa and to live that long, actually, to serve the ummah longer than probably any other sahaba radiallahu anhu, the khulafa rashidin Because Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he, uh, he established the state. Uh, Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he expanded the state. But now you need a businessman to sustain <laughs> that state. And Uthman was a brilliant businessman. He was a businessman. The state at that time needed someone of his genius to make that system actually work very well. SubhanAllah. A businessman. Because, I mean, how, how clever was he, radiallahu anhu wa when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, who can support, you know, uh, uh, the Jaysh al-Usra, the entire army of al-Usra, a hundred camel, completely full supplies, for the journey, a hundred camel, just without any supplies, that's a one million dollar, you could say. Now, supplied with everything, you probably talk about millions of dollars in, that, in, in today's currency, obviously. And Uthman says, I'll take care of it, Ya Rasulullah. And then, who can buy the water of Be'er Ruma, the, 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 the water well of Ruma? He goes, I'll take care of it, Ya Rasulullah. When the people left the Jum'ah Salah to go and catch that caravan, and business people, they're fighting right now to buy it from the owner, Uthman, radiallahu he goes, uh, uh, someone paid me more than that. We're going to pay you double, triple, four times, five times, ten times. He said, someone is paying me more than that. They said, look, we're the merchants, we're the guild of, of Medina. We're the whole merchant people of Medina and business people of Medina. No one can pay more than this. He goes, Allah. And he says, this is all free. Now, I keep wondering, honestly, where is this money coming from? Like He has a whole, mashallah, a pipeline of wealth that keeps coming through and coming in. No matter what he gives, mashallah, is still coming in. Until now. Until now. Subhanallah. The His barakah, awqaf Uthman in Medina, still until this day functioning. And alhamdulillah, he's reaping the benefit and the khair from this. You see the building says, Waqf Uthman ibn Affar radiallahu anhu wa Until this day, subhanallah. He was a businessman, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he put him there for a reason. So when he established a society, prosperity, put the financial system for the ummah, then came the little ones and the young ones who did not grow up in the difficulty of the establishment of the state, they say, Look at him. He sees the money. He's favoring this, he's favoring that. It's all about economics again. Although he was the one behind subhanahu wa ta'ala, that great system, radiallahu ta'ala, an Uthman warda. That's how, I mean, that's how Allah tests your sincerity. Nah. What did Maryam alayhi salam value more than her chastity? And that's what she's going to be accused of. What did Uthman radiallahu anhu value more than sadaqah? And the accusation from these little fools, and we can, we can curse them, I mean, really, like these little idiots. What did they accuse Uthman of? They said he's stealing money from the treasury? Like, are you people out of your minds? 
The man gave everything in the most difficult moments for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now he's going to turn around and, you know, he, Does he and, care about money in that moment? Favoritism of his relatives. So the worst, Allah will test you. So that you're, you're, you're accused in the thing that is most precious to you. And how did Maryam respond? Ibadah. How did Uthman respond? Ibadah. So the point is, is that that's how Allah is going to really, really put you to the test. Like, is this really about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you? Or is it about the sweetness of that here? Because guess what? Good behavior has good consequence here too. Everyone loves a generous person. Right? Everyone loves a generous person. But when people, and, and by the way, I say this subhanAllah, like it was a conversation I was having with a brother. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him. I mean. His brother gave money to the masjid. Lots of money. Hmm. Anonymous. The same brother was accused of some sort of financial mishandling. He did an investigation, subhanAllah. All the financial investigation, by the way, this isn't here. All the financial investigation showed was actually that he gave even more sadaqah than they thought. <laughs> and like people were like, man, we're so sorry. Like this, the shame that overcame them. Like we, how, how, how dare we, right? And you know what? SubhanAllah, he persisted. And told him that was Allah Azza wa Jal making sure this is only for him alone. This wasn't for the people. This was only for him alone. Because sometimes Allah will let the people give you a headache to make sure that your heart is about him and not about them. Shaykh, you, you touched the point that is very scary, Wallahi, is uh, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could sometimes test you with the thing that you love the most. Yeah. Not just, uh, not just Maryam, not just Uthman, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Yeah, subhanAllah. What was, what was the thing Ibrahim was looking for all his entire life? What was he desiring to have? What was he loving to have? Just a child. Just have a child. Allah says, I'll give you one. And he gave him Ismail. The moment Ismail was born, what happened? Ibrahim was excited, was happy with that child. But then what came to Ibrahim as a test? That child that you love the most, I want you to go and send him all the way in the desert. Now, if you were in the place of Ibrahim, what would you say? I mean, I just, I was waiting for this moment, right? Samana wa ta'ana. We listen, yeah, we obey. Allah. And he goes to send his family down there in the desert. As he was leaving, his wife telling him, Ya Ibrahim, where are you leaving us? Is that what Allah is asking you to do? He goes, Allahumma na'am. Yes, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She said, just go ahead. Allah will take care of us. And then as he was going back and forth to check on his child, subhanAllah, then the, the moment came when he reached that age and to be pleased with his, with his, with his, his child, subhanAllah. The, and, and, and they both raised the foundation of the Kaaba as a reward for their service. What did Allah ask Ibrahim to do? Sacrifice that child that he loved the most. And Ibrahim says, my son, look, I'm seeing this in my dream. What do I do? Qala ya abati. Father, if this is from Allah, do it. You'll find me a patient one, inshallah ta'ala. Like, what kind of household is this, Ya Shaykh? That is all based on truly submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The father, the mother, the child, generation of submission, ummah of submission built on Ibrahim alayhi salam. And, and, and that's why we're called Muslimin. Those who submit themselves to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's my advice to my dear brothers and sisters. The sooner, the faster you really let go and start gliding in Allah's grace subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah's yani kingdom, the easier life gets on you. But if the more you try to control the things that you're not meant to get in this dunya, the harder it gets on you. So therefore, just enjoy it. Enjoy being in the rahmah and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You only need to do your part. And be careful what you love the most. Be careful what you wish for. As the Prophet says, قال, When you love someone or love something, love it moderately. Because one day this might be the thing that you hate the most. And when you hate somebody, hate them moderately because you never know. One day they might become the most beloved person to you. Everything with moderation is great, Shaykh. What's your final thoughts, inshallah? I want to give another analogy. Ya Allah. All right. Are you sick of my analogy, Shaykh? <laughs> As long as no, uh, May Allah park, uh, you. no, no more park a lot uh, things on. I don't know, man. Who took my spot? Is that your cousin? <laughs> All right. Here's the analogy that I was thinking of. Not about romance, right? No, 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 no. Actually, Maskeem, you're, you're throwing me off, no, man. So, 
Uh, we had the main, uh, Hassan, who's the main actor from Why Me? I think we killed him. <laughs> I, broke his, I broke his heart telling him romance is risk. No. Nah. Poor guy went through like misery and like now we're burying him. It's a skill. Don't it's worry a about skill. It. Sheikh Yasser is going to talk to you and make you feel better. Man. So <laughs> <laughs> he'll explain life to you. Because clearly I couldn't, I couldn't give you the right advice. No. Nah. All right, here's the, uh, here's, here's the, the, the analogy I, I just can't stop thinking about. Because the da'wa da'wa, the disease and the cure, the medicine. Mm. Every medicine has what on it? What's, what's on the label? Side effects, yeah. right? Side effects. And it's, it's funny now when you watch a commercial because like they have to like by law like tell you the side effects, right? So like they use this really enthusiastic voice. It's like how the shaitan tells you about the side effects, right? <laughs> your, your sins, you know, like really enthusiastic voice. Like you do this, you're gonna be great. You're like, you know, playing golf. And uh, for some reason these guys are always playing golf. Uh, family life is great, like everything is so amazing and big smiles and then it's like side effects include and then it goes and it's like all these like dark quick you, like You're gonna die basically. Yeah, basically. <laughs> you know, so you were trying to cure one thing but you're gonna have a heart attack, get cancer, liver disease and die within five days. Like, but they say it really quietly, right? Now, side effects. Sin is sold to you as medicine. Shaitan gives it to you as medicine. Because he's telling you, this will help you with your pain. This will help you with your desire. This will make you feel better. But he hides the side effects, right? And those side effects are catastrophic, and the medicine isn't as effective as he's made it out to be, right? So what do the side effects include? Loss of barakah, loss of wealth, loss of prestige, loss of honor, loss of self-worth. Loss of, loss of, loss of, loss of Allah, the most catastrophic. Loss of Jannah, loss of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And the withdrawal systems are terrible. And as Ata' rahimahullah said, that a sin is always followed by regrets, right? Or it's always followed by consequences, right? So, you know, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah mentioned, a sin is a temporary moment of pleasure followed by an eternity of regret, whereas a good deed is a temporary moment of pain followed by an eternity of pleasure, right? Because everything you think about, the good deed that's given to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also medicine, but it has side effects. <laughs> Do people think that they will say, we believe, that's it, and they're not going to be tested, they're not going to be tried? <laughs> we have tested those who came before, right? Who are those that came before? Ibrahim. We will know the truthful ones. When you think truthful, Ibrahim as Siddiq is right up there, right? And from this Ummah, Abu Bakr as Siddiq is right up there. Truthful ones. We will know who is truthful and we will know who the hypocrites are. We'll know who's not selling the truth. So the label of your good deed, the medicine that's given to you of your good deed, the only thing that you need to know of the side effects. The guarantee, what it will give you, it will give you the pleasure of Allah, it will give you paradise, it will give you everything that you're seeking. And it's bitter in its initial part because medicine doesn't taste good, right? It's bitter in its initial part. The only side effect that you need to realize is you will be tested. There will be fitna that comes to you as a result of what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making sure that you're sincere for His sake. That fitna will come usually through people, usually through people, or through other things, but you will be put to test. And that's you know, sort of like the initial injection. The body has to go through a process to receive it. The soul has to go through a process to receive it. Then once you taste it, you'll never want to go back because here's the thing, we are beings that seek pleasure. And the only way to replace the pursuit of the pleasure that comes to you through sin is to enjoy the pleasure that comes to you of good deeds. And then it's like, man, why would I ever go back to that when I've experienced this? You see how you feel right now? Do you feel like this any other time of the year anywhere else than you do in the last 10 nights of Ramadan in the masjid? Do you get that pleasure anywhere else? And what are the side effects of being here? A little bit of sleep issues? SubhanAllah, it's beautiful. So think of the two bottles Allah Azza wa gave you, the medicine. His pleasure, his paradise, the side effect, fitna. The bottle from shaitan, the side effects are catastrophic and it's not even effective. 
It just is wrapped in a really, really good label and has a really, really good marketing agency behind it. That's it. But at the end of the day, it's not going to do you any good. So yeah. we have a lot of questions over here. But somebody is very excited and actually keeps saying that multiple times. I didn't want to mention it, but this time I have to. So here there's a comment, and there's actually 16 votes on this comment that says Sheikh Yasser has better style than Sheikh Omar. <laughs> What's your say about this? You know, 16 <laughs> votes. <laughs> now, <laughs> the votes are now 23, 24. Mashallah. 16 people have abused me. <laughs> 16 people are fit enough for me, but you know. No, no, <laughs> but it's no. okay, Sheikh. Everyone knows the truth. MashaAllah. I mean, <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go serious, inshallah, on this discussion. It's very, wallahi, it's a very uh, uh, serious matter here. Many, many people, subhanAllah, they, they feel that touched by the subject, uh, knowing that, you know, um, if this is the case, I mean, somebody's saying, look, I mean, if I'm, if I'm out of that circle of ihsan and, and maybe, I don't know if I'm even in a circle of iman anymore, is there hope in returning back to that circle? So, uh, honestly speaking, um, you know, I, I really, subhanAllah, and, and I'm, not, I'm not just saying this uh, for the work that was put into it, but like the, my, the most important episode we had of Why Me that was episode 10, Are You Really a Muslim? Because mm. you've got to ask yourself that question. And the Prophet ﷺ gave you a cure for all of your falling away from Islam. So shifa al a su'al. Maybe you have questions. Get your questions answered. Go seek the answer to them. Or maybe there's personal trauma that is inducing an intellectual crisis. So try to deal with the personal trauma and at least see the connection between how that personal trauma induced the intellectual crisis. Or maybe you're stuck. Maybe the lure of sin is just really, really, really strong for you. And you're trying to convince yourself that that sin is not as bad as it actually is because right now it's giving you what you feel like you need. So learn about the sin and disconnect yourself from it. But is there hope for you? Yes. Wallahi, there's hope for you. The fact that you're alive, the fact that you're even asking, is there hope for me is a sign that there's hope for you. You've just got to want it. That's actually at the end of the day, like who is Allah talking about in this regard? Like who does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just say, you know what, go, go. It's a person who's falling and doesn't even care that they're falling anymore. Not a person who's trying to get back up. A person who's trying to get back up is not abandoned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا Those who strive in our way, we will guide them to our paths. The ulama say about this verse, again, how the, the genius of our religion, that the same verse can apply to people in opposite circumstances. They say it means one of two things or two of the, the benefits of it. It actually, can, it actually opens up many, many doors, subhanAllah. One of them is that when a person is pursuing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ihsan, in excellence, Allah opens the doors of ihsan for them. No. So you're pursuing salah, Allah lets you taste the sweetness of salah, and then Allah lets you taste the sweetness of the Qur'an. Now when you're tasting the sweetness of the Qur'an, that necessitates as you're striving to understand the Qur'an and taste the sweetness, how can you then read the verses about sadaqah and not taste the sweetness of sadaqah? So now you're tasting the sweetness of sadaqah. So the, the doors of good open for you. Another benefit of this is a person who is seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, jahadu fina, they're striving in Allah, that could be in tawbah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send you a bunch of lifelines to welcome you back to Him. No. So whether you're seeking Allah from down here, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا Allah is going to throw you a bunch of ropes that will give you a way back to Him, an opportunity back to Him. Or whether you're on the rope, or whether you're in that pursuit of Ihsan, Allah Azza wa unlocks the next door of Ihsan, the next door of Ihsan, the next door of Ihsan. But Allah will always unlock for the striving person. It's as simple as that. The one who's striving, Allah will unlock will unlock, will unlock, will open, will open, will open. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to respond to his call in the last third of every night, not just in the last third of the night tonight. Amen. May Allah allow us to be amongst those that respond to his call frequently. Amen. Amen. I want to clarify something here on this question. Someone is asking uh, about the people who uh, cross over the bridge and fall into Jahannam, and then the believers go and collect them out from Jahannam. The question is that do they go into Jahannam literally? Well, Hadith in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, yes, they do. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will shield these believers from Jahannam for being touched by the flames of Jahannam. And they go, how? Allahu A'lam. We don't know how exactly, specifically, in, the, in terms of details. But we know that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will allow them to go in there and collect these people from there. Are they going to have the fear 
the anxiety, the worries, the pain at the sight of what they see there? Perhaps no, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the people of Jannah from them, from going through that. So how? We don't know, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow them to pull these people out from Jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from being there, Rabbil Alameen. I love the righteous even though I don't count myself amongst them so that perhaps I may benefit from their intercession. This is one of the ways the ulama mentioned that. Look, if you have righteous friends and you're trying to put yourself in the company of righteous people, then mm. even when you fall short, those righteous people will pull you up, will pull you up, will pull you up in this dunya and in the akhirah and the hereafter as well. And the most righteous person that you can love is who? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Someone is asking, Shaykh, he says, the example of secret ibadat, secret worships. You said charity. What else can people do when it comes to ibadat and consider it secret between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? First of all, charity is not just with money. Mm. It could be that you help someone out and no one knows that you helped that person out. It could be that you visited, subhanAllah, I was sharing with Shaykh Yasser, like the beauty of this program that we just instituted at VR, what do we call it, Shaykh? VRC? Uh, VRC uh, Value Visits. Oh, visits of value. Visits value of visits. value. We oh. just started a program with the masjid to visit the sick. And I hope many of you enlist in that program, inshallah. So you go visit someone in the hospital and no one knows that you went to visit that person in the hospital and you brought something to them. That's yeah. a, a secret between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your yeah. secret Qur'an habit, your secret Qiyam habit, some secret fasting that you do where no one knows about it. SubhanAllah, some of the Salaf would hide their fasting even from their families. You know, there's one of the Salaf I remember, SubhanAllah, reading uh, from uh, Imam Ghazali rahimahullah uh, in his ihya that this, this man would, his wife would prepare his food for him in the morning and he'd go out and he'd give it to someone on the way and he'd come home at the time of iftar and he'd just pretend it was his dinner and she, she didn't reveal it for like 40 years you know, subhanAllah, that this is what you were doing this whole time you take the food in the morning, give it so you want to hide something between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you, you spared someone, you, you helped someone out you forgave someone for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you could have taken revenge on someone and he said, you know what, no, I'm not going to do that you know, Shaykh, if I want to add more, in, it doesn't have to be something yani, uh, great that requires a lot of resources. All right. Just dua. Wow. Having, having a moment of dua that is regular between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maintaining the, the morning and evening dhikr, for example. Being generous to people. You have a neighbor that you always help them out with something, for instance. Uh, whatever that is, something little, something little that you use constantly and, and continuously. And it is very dear to you because you're doing this only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, it doesn't have to be something with big resources, really. Anything little that you do, but you have, you have it in your heart. You're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It could be the one that will give you, Allah, the ticket to al al-A'la. Absolutely. So it doesn't have to be something of big magnitude, but something with great sincerity in the heart, inshallah ta'ala. So, so Shaykh, love the righteous and love the ways of the righteous. No. Why do you love the righteous? What makes you love the salihin? Do you love them because of something like some allure around them or do you love them because of their righteousness and so you love their ways and so you want to adapt their ways in your life as well. So you know, there's a very important question. Someone says, you know, this discussion makes me think right now to get at that level, to get at that level, I have to go through a lot of challenges uh, in order for me to, to feel that I'm going to earn that level. And they bring the example, says the people of Gaza, may Allah make it easy for them. Ya Rabbi Amen. Amen. So they're going through so much like they say that I think I need to go through the same in order to exercise that patience that will get me that status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that a, way, a good way of thinking? Allah knows how much to test you. No. And Allah knows what to test you with. And Allah knows our capacity. And sometimes out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't give us what we want sometimes as a test, confident that we will pass that test. Um, and it's Shaykh, profound. as well, the, the test, many, many people, when, when they think of testing, they always think of what? Adversities. Mm. They don't think of prosperity as being yeah. a test. You know, may Allah make it easy again for the people of Gaza, Ya Rabbil Alameen. They've been tested for being, to be patient. We've been tested for being compassionate and being generous and being actually grateful. Are we doing our part? I mean, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah protect us all, Ya Rabbi Alameen, if we were subjugated to the same test that they're going through, probably we would fail miserably. Their circumstances, subhanAllah, they're, they're mashallah, they're doing well with their test. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easier than again. But for us here, what are we doing? Don't think that you're not tested, being tested. Probably your test is, is severe in your own condition, in your own circumstances. 
because you've been given so much and you're not using this in the right way. So and that's another I, way of thinking about it, Yanni. Absolutely, Sheikh. One example that, um, that I gave recently, you know, because if you look at the Prophet Sallallahu he passed the test of bribery and the test of pain, the test of prosperity, the test of persecution. What does that look like? You know, you, you break someone down and then you offer them terms. That's what, that's what Quraysh's psychological warfare on the Prophet Sallallahu was. Break him down, make him desperate, then offer him a way out, right? After you've taken everything from him, tell him we'll give you everything if you give up your religion. And the Prophet Sallallahu kept passing that test over and over and over again. You have the people of Gaza that can be beaten on in ways that no human being should ever be beaten on and we cannot fathom as people on the outside of Gaza. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala grant them the full reward. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala reward them and grant them shahada. Amen. And may Allah Azza wa compensate them <clears throat> generously for every single moment of struggle that they have. And then you have the owner of Khan Abu Khadija, mm. the bakery in Jerusalem, who, by the way, when we were in Turkey, mm. if you remember when we were in Hafiz yes, Mustafa, yes. by the way, we went on a secret trip to Turkey. We didn't tell you guys. True story, by the way. So when we were in Turkey... <laughs> no longer secret, man. <laughs> secret, right? No, but a, a group of us, obviously, a group of Mashaikh had, had gone. We'd spent some... This was in the wake of the death of Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif, <laughs> rahimahullah <laughs> ta'ala. We decided to come together and obviously just kind of grieve together over his death and share that perspective. And when I was in Hafiz Mustafa in Turkey, no. uh, I ran into the owner. I w so I got held up. You guys are waiting for me downstairs. I got mm. held up because I ran into the owner of this bakery in Jerusalem, Khan Abu Khadija. No. So this guy was offered $40 million to give up his bakery in Jerusalem. Why? Because the Zionists employ multiple strategies. They beat some people down, they persecute some people, right? They go in, the settlers just abuse and take pieces of land. The dual strategy is what? They send an Arab, an Arab buyer to these people, right, that own land. And the Arab buyer just seems like a simple Muslim who's purchasing land. So he offers you an enormous amount of money for your small piece of land. So it's settlement expansion, and it's also bribery, right? Now, if you're a person, you're a Palestinian, you're in desperation, it's like, hey, this guy looks like a Muslim, right? He's, he's, he's an Arab, he looks like a Muslim, he's speaking my language, and he's offering me just this, huge, I don't know why he's offering me this amount of money for it, but sure. What does that guy do? He goes around and he turns and he gives it to the Israelis. It's happened to multiple people. By the way, even in my family, in my family, it has happened to us, where alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, no one in my family actually did it, but we've, you know, our family back home has been offered lots of money by buyers from a particular Muslim country, right? That act as agents on behalf of the Israelis. This guy, Khan Abu Khadija, the owner of that bakery, $40 million. He can justify it. He could say, hey, you know, like I just sold the bakery. Alhamdulillah, I made my business. It's precious. But he knows exactly what's going to happen, that that will cause the further destruction of Jerusalem. He is also murabit, he's also holding it down. Like these people are holding it down. So the driver is one, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not gonna be deluded by the money and I'm not gonna be deluded by the bombs. Because I'm pursuing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, we test you with good and we test you with bad, fitna, as a fitna for you. So we're all being tested. You are being tested right now in your comfort. They're being tested in their hardship. May Allah Azza wa allow us all to pass our test and see His pleasure at the end of it. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all from the evil of, uh, of this fitan, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our brothers and sisters in Gaza, Ya Allah. Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower them with His mercy and with His rahmah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ameen. And to deliver them the victory that He promised, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this blessed night to send His rahmah upon us all, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring the angels upon us, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ameen. to fill our hearts with love and mercy for another. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring sakina and tranquility in our lives in this dunya and in the akhirah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And the way we all gather in this place, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us together in Jannah al-Firdaus al-A'la, ala surur al-Mutaqabilin with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.